And so William Fetter, uh, how many of you, have you heard him on American Minute? You've heard him before? Yes, great. Has that, am I on? But he is a nationally known speaker, best-selling author, and president of AmeriSearch, a publishing company that dedicated to researching America's noble heritage. Bill is an expert on American history and its founding and founders. So we're really blessed to have him. He, he's, he's author of a multitude of books. You can see him out there in the, in the gathering area. He's also uh, been a candidate for Congress. Bill has appeared on C-SPAN, Fox, Hannity, CBN, The Eric Metaxas Show, Prager University, and Todd Starnes Program. So we're blessed to have uh, Bill Fetter with us today. Bill. Thank you, Pastor Joe. The, um, it's an honor for me to, to be with you, and uh, I'm just going to jump into my presentation. I do have a daily email I send out called American Minute. You can sign up for it at AmericanMinute.com. And uh, I teach history, and you think, well, history is not prophetic, but it is predictive. Past behavior is the best indicator of future performance, and so with knowing history and prophetic, you get a pretty good idea where things are headed. So one of the things I did is I decided I would research every single century of recorded human history to find out what the most common form of government is, and it's kings. And um, it took centuries before America was given a chance to break away from a king. And uh, so writing was invented around 3300 BC. Uh, take a stick, poke it in clay, right? Sumerian, cuneiform. And uh, Egyptian hieroglyphics were invented around 3000 BC, and Chinese characters around 2600 BC. And uh, same with the Indus Valley. Neil deGrasse Tyson, an astrophysicist in his Cosmos TV series, stood in the desert. And he said, it was here around 5,000 years ago between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers that we learned how to write, right? 5,000, so that we're 2080 or so. This is about 3,000 or so BC. And um, Franklin Roosevelt said, 5,000 years of recorded history have proven that mankind has always believed in God in spite of the many abortive attempts to exile God. Richard Overy wrote The Times Complete History of the World. He said, no date appears before the start of human civilizations around 5,500 years ago and the beginning of a written or pictorial history. And so let's just round it out to 6,000 because some of the founders use that number in their quotes. But 6,000 years of history, it's not that long. 6,000 years is just 60 people living 100 years each back to back. How many of you, how many of you have met someone who's lived 100 years? Maybe a grandmother? We're talking 60 grandmothers, and you're all the way back to the beginning of recorded human history. 60 people living 100 years each, back to back, is 6,000 years. And now that we have 6,000 years of records, let's look at them. What do they show? They show it's been a 6,000 year quest to rule the world. And the first one was Nimrod Tower of Babel. And um, Josephus, the Jewish commentator, said Nimrod wanted to build the tower so high that if God destroyed the world again with a flood, he could survive on top. So it had this defiant, in-your-face attitude toward God. And Nimrod made everyone in town bake bricks and bring them, or he would kill them. And so it was oppressive over man. God comes down, confuses the languages, and the people scatter. But it's almost like every generation since has tried to rebuild the Tower of Babel. And each time it comes around, it's a little bit worse. Because with military advancements, kings can kill more people. And with technological advancements, kings can track more people. And... Um, Ever saw the movie The Terminator with Arnold Schwarzenegger? Right? There's this metal robot that's chasing him, and they smash it, and uh, everybody in the audience sighs relief. But then this little pieces of metal melt into little silvery droplets, and then they sort of roll back together into this silvery pool, and then the hand of this Terminator starts coming out, and it somehow reassembles itself and starts chasing him, and everybody in the audience is like, how do you get rid of this thing? It's like, how do you get rid of this desire for man to want to mankind to want to have the Tower of Babel rebuilt? And, um, you know, in geometry, there's something called the golden ratio, or phi, P-H-I, or the Fibonacci sequence, but it's a rate of geometric expansion that you observe in a seashell, in a tornado, in a hurricane, even in a galaxy. And it gets applied to other areas of academia, like investments. 
right? When Bitcoin first started taking off, they said, oh, it's going to grow at this rate, and this rate, it's going to grow. And I thought, has anybody applied it to history, to these kingdoms in history? And I hadn't, so I started to piece it together. And you got Nimrod, Tower of Babel. And then 2500 BC, you have Gilgamesh, king of Uruk, or Iraq. And he, the oldest story ever written in any language is the Epic of Gilgamesh. And he is the first one to put a wall around a city. And he goes on this long journey to meet this old guy who survived a global flood. Calls it a global flood. And um, the, uh, this old guy had built a boat, covered it with tar and pitch, filled it full of animals. The world was flooded and afterwards uh, repopulated the world. It's the story of Noah, written a thousand years before Moses. Matter of fact, over a hundred ancient civilizations have flood stories in their ancient past. And um, then in 25, 2250 BC, you have Sargon of Acadia, and he conquers a bunch of walled cities from the Persian Gulf to the Mediterranean. And then there's 2,000 years of Egyptian pharaohs, and 5,000 years of Chinese emperors, and then around 700 BC, Assyria is the biggest empire the planet had seen up to this point. And Assyria takes the 10 northern tribes of Israel captive. But Assyria is conquered by Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, which is conquered by Cyrus of Persia. And this Living is the, the largest empire that planet Earth had seen up to this point. And around the 5th, 6th century BC. But Persia is conquered by Alexander the Great. And 334 BC, he's got the biggest empire. And he stopped from going into India. And then India has Chandra Gupta and the Mara Empire. And it's the biggest empire, quarter of the world's population. And then around 25 BC, Augustus Caesar has the biggest empire, followed by Tiberius Caesar. And what do they do? They decide to do a census. It's a track. They want to track everybody. They want a worldwide tracking system. And uh, if they could add 5G and cell phones and uh, the satellites, they would have done that. And then you have an Ascomite empire in Africa. And then Attila the Hun, 450 AD. He's got the biggest empire. All of Central Asia and conquering Europe. And then you have the Byzantine Empire. And then in the 7th century, Islam. And they conquer from the Persian Gulf to the Atlantic Ocean. They conquer Spain. And then the Muslims are stopped from going into Europe. And you got... Uh, by Charles Martel. His grandson is Charlemagne. He's got the biggest empire. He's crowned Holy Roman Emperor in 800 AD. And then you got the Vikings, the year 1000, and they got boats with low keels. They go up every river in Europe and Russia, and they've got the biggest empire. And then you got 1200s. Genghis Khan conquers from Korea to Hungary, and they have the, the composite bow, right? New military advancement where you can shoot the bow and arrow uh, like 100 yards while you're riding a horse. And, um, and so uh, he kills 30 million people and has the biggest empire. And then his grandson's Kublai Khan that runs China. And then the 1400s, you got Tamerlane, kills 17 million, Central Asia. And then Ivan the Terrible in Russia, he's got the biggest empire, 12 time zones. Russia's huge. And then you cross the hemisphere to the west, and you have Montezuma. And he's in charge of the Aztec Mexican Empire. And Atahualpa is in charge of Inca Peru. And it's centralized, and they're kings. And, and then you have the king of Spain, 1500s, largest empire that planet Earth had seen up to this point. The Philippines are named after his son, King Philip of Spain. And then there's the 1600s, the king of France, Louis XIV, the sun king. He's got the biggest empire. And he actually used to own the land that we're on. And, um, and then in the 1700s, 1800s, the King of Britain has the largest empire that planet Earth had ever seen. The King of England was a globalist. He was a one-world government guy with him at the top. Matter of fact, if any of these dictators had not have died, any one of them would have been happy to keep killing and conquering. So in that sense, death is a blessing, <laughs> and the devil has to start from scratch again. But anybody that can see that there's you can plot, you can plot on a graph that at some point it's going to max out on a global level. And Jesus says, wheat and tares grow together till the harvest. Right? And, um, and, it, and I think, well, why are there the crisis? You know, before the flood, they were living centuries. They were living nearly a thousand years. And they, right before the flood, it says, the thoughts of man were on evil continually. And they chose not to retain God in their thoughts. And it repented God that he even made man. It, and then one translation says it broke his heart. 
So why did I even make him? Could you imagine the Holy Spirit hovering in front of somebody's face for a thousand years, trying to get their attention, and they so structured their lives, they can live every day and not even think about him? And so it's, in a sense, God has plan A and plan B, right? He makes us as free will beings, gives us, wants us to turn to him. And, um, and so uh, plan A is he blesses us. He had to bless them with, with health and food. They were living these centuries. He blesses. Uh, so God blesses you and hopes that you turn to him out of gratefulness. If that doesn't work, mm, there is plan B. <laughs> he withholds the blessings. It says in Deuteronomy 28, he hides his face and lets you experience the consequences of your selfish decisions, and it gets bad, and then you turn to him out of desperation. Right? His goal is to have you turn to him, and there's an easy way and there's a hard way. <laughs> And through these centuries, when there's desperation, is when people end up turning to the Lord. So it's in times of crises that people turn to Christ. And um, anyway, so why does it keep repeating itself that power wants to concentrate? Because it's in each of our own fallen, selfish human DNA. And you got uh, Cain killing Abel, and one king taking a kingdom from another king. St. Augustine called it libido dominandi, the lust to dominate. And so you put some babies in a playpen, one takes the rattle from the others. You put some kids on a playground, one's the bully hogging the ball. You put some junior high girls in a clique, and one of them is the diva. <laughs> you put some natives in the woods, one of them is an Indian chief, and you put them in an inner city, one of them is a gang leader. And all a king is, is a glorified gang leader. It's a hierarchical system. If you are friends with the king, you are more equal. If you are not friends with the king, you are less equal. And if you're an enemy of the king, you're dead. It's called treason. Or you're a slave. People say, I thought slavery started in 1619. No, wherever you had the first king on top, you had slaves on the bottom. Right? It's a hierarchical system that keeps repeating itself wherever you have humans. <laughs> and it keeps happening around the world, and at some point it's going to max out on a global level. And you think of it, what if you were the king? That'd be pretty neat. And then you have a sister, she, she gets married, she has a kid, now the kid's a teenager. He's drinking and partying and hits someone with the car and kills him. And now he's facing manslaughter charges and prison time, and your sister comes begging to you. He says, you're not going to let my little Johnny get locked away, are you? It wasn't his fault. Those other kids talked him into it, blah, blah, blah. What are you going to say to your own sister? Well, I'll uh, let little Johnny off the hook this time, but don't let it happen again. Guess what? As soon as you say that, you are the corrupt dictator. You just sent ripples through your kingdom that if somebody's family or friends with the king, they get special treatment. If they're not family and friends, they don't get that. And if someone wants to point out your favoritism, you're going to be embarrassed and be tempted to shut them up and get oppressive. So it just happens. Power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. And so um, you see that power wants to concentrate. It's like the pull of a magnet, like the law of gravity. Uh, even the movie Lord of the Rings, uh, there's a line where Gandalf tells Frodo, Always remember, Frodo, the ring is trying to get back to its master. It wants to be found. Power wants to concentrate. And uh, the movie goes on where little Frodo offers the ring to Gandalf. And Gandalf says, don't tempt me, Frodo. I dare not take it, not even to keep it safe. Understand, Frodo, I would use this ring from a desire to do good. But through me, it would wield the power too great and terrible to imagine. What's he talking about? Every now and then, you get a good king. And he wants to concentrate power so he can do good more efficiently. But he doesn't live forever. And at some point, that concentrated power gets passed on to some son or grandson that's a lousy ruler, but he likes his job, and he gets oppressive. And it's almost like the devil takes a little break and lets you do your own stuff, but as soon as you're gone, he's back in it with a vengeance. What's the Bible example? Joseph in Egypt concentrates power into the hands of the Pharaoh. And what did that particular Pharaoh do with the power? He fed the children of Israel, gave them the best land of Goshen, gave him jobs taking care of his cattle. He was good. But then there was a new Pharaoh that did not know Joseph, and he used all that concentrated power to oppress the children of Israel, make them slaves, and even throw their sons in the Nile River. All right? And so we see this pull toward globalism. And what's the opposite of globalism? Localism. <laughs> in other words, we see this happening. Uh, you know, I ran for Congress three times and raised lots of money and, and um, uh, didn't win, came close. But the idea is you tell it, tell it to most people. And you're like, forget that. I can't, I can't raise money. 
But if you say, look, you drive by that school every day and you know they're teaching transgenderism, and you know Jesus said in the beginning God made a male and female, and, um, and if you're silent, you're giving consent to that sin. And, and Jesus says that if you allow one of these little ones that believes me to stumble better than a millstone we put around your neck, and there's more people in church than vote in the school board election. <laughs> If local, just be concerned about what kids are talking about in your local area. And so the, so it's the opposite of globalism is get involved locally, locally. And, and um, anyway, so the devil takes Jesus to a high mountain, shows him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, all this authority I will give you, for this has been delivered to me, and I give it to whomever I wish. Therefore, if you will worship before me, all will be yours. And Jesus answered, Get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. You think that's pretty audacious of the devil to say that all the kingdoms of the world were delivered to him? When did he get them? When Adam sinned. Adam was in charge of the garden. We know that because he named everything. If you name something, you have authority over something. You have kids, you get to name your kids. So Adam was in charge, but the Bible says, to whomever you yield your members' servants to obey, to him you are a servant. The moment Adam obeyed Satan, he was posturing himself as the one taking the orders, and the devil usurped power as the one giving the orders. <laughs> and what is one of the similarities of all the kingdoms of the world? They're all ruled through fear. That's, as Montesquieu said, that's the motivating spring. That's the, the electricity that goes through these kingdoms. It's fear. And um, Jesus said, the kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, but ye shall not be so. He that is greatest among you, let him be as he that doth serve. I am among you as he that serveth. So we're talking kingdoms, and Jesus is talking about his kingdom, and his kingdom is bottom up, and the motivating electricity is love. <laughs> So you got fear top down, but you got love. So we're talking two different kinds of kingdoms. And uh, in a kingdom, who is the hardest person to meet? Well, the king. He's got a whole army and soldiers surrounding him. Well, if God's is the opposite in God's kingdom, who's the easiest person to meet? God himself. <laughs> He's as close as your heart and your mouth and the word, right? And um, so the, the world's is top down fear. In God's kingdom is bottom-up love, but we're talking kingdoms. You know, in reading through all these ancient, ancient kingdoms, I saw three things repeating themselves. One is the people groups would move from hunter-gathering to agriculture. We even have the Bible talking about Adam and Eve gathering, right, plucking food off the tree, and then Cain being a tiller of the soil. So we go from gathering to agriculture. And... Uh, but it, this is something you observe when you read anthropology, hunter-gatherers to agriculture. And once they moved to agriculture, they needed to know when to plant the crops. So they needed to keep track of the seasons. And so they needed to keep track of the stars. And so they would begin to build big, immovable structures to observe the stars. Stonehenge, ziggurats, pyramids, Cahokia Mounds, all these different big structures, immovable, and they all had something to do with looking at the stars. And then somebody got to climb up the building, look at the stars, and come down with the secret knowledge from heaven as to when to plant the barley <laughs> and when to plant the oats, you know, because they had different growing seasons and they wanted to get it after the last spring, you know, flooding and before the, the fall frost. And, and so you see these once they moved to agriculture, they wanted to build these buildings so that they could look at the stars. And, and then the person would come down from this building, and there there would, they would claim to be an intermediary between the heavens above and all these common people down below. And before you know it, it went to their head, and you had these Babylonian Assyrian kings were king priests, and the Egyptian pharaohs were son of the god Osiris, and the Roman emperors, uh, as the cult of the deified August Caesar, they demanded their image be worshipped as a god. Chinese emperors claimed they had a mandate from heaven to rule. Inca emperors claimed to be delegates of the sun god. A Muslim caliphs claimed to be successors of the messenger of Allah. In India, they had the rajas, which were a semi-divine caste of rulers, the Japanese emperors, heavenly sovereigns, and then they Christianized it in Europe and called it the divine right of kings. God chose me to be the king, the intermediary, 
And so whatever my will is must be God's will because he put me here. So I can pretty well do anything I want. And if you're challenging me, you're challenging God, and I can crush you. <laughs> and so this divine right of kings was what we saw. The creator gives the power to this one guy, and he gives it to these lowly subjects. Here's King Louis XIV, the sun king, because his subjects were planets that revolved around him every day. He said, I am the state. Talk about an ego. And then one time his, admi his advisors said, King, you can't do this particular thing. It's illegal. He goes, it is legal because I wish it. It's like, okay, uh, I get it. The laws are nothing more than the king's wishes, and he just happens to have a really powerful army to make you obey. Here's King James. Jamestown is named after him. He says, kings are God's lieutenants upon earth, sit upon God's throne. The king is the overlord of the whole land, master over every person, having power over the life and death of everyone. Can you begin to see why America's founders wanted to break away from this guy? And so here's the British Empire at its biggest extent. It was a globalist empire. The king of England was a one-world government guy. He wanted to be at the top, and kings have subjects who are subjected to their will. Democracies and republics have citizens. The word citizen is Greek. It means co-sovereign, co-ruler, co-king. You're a citizen of America. You are a co-king of America. So America's founders took the king and they flipped it. And if it wasn't for a 3,000-mile ocean and if it wasn't for the Reformation and so forth, it would have never happened. So it took centuries before America was able to break from a king, and you have one of the signers of the Declaration, James Wilson, said, after a period of 6,000 years since creation, the United States exhibit to the world the first instance of a nation assembling voluntarily and deciding that system of government under which they should live. So he uses the number 6,000 and says something unique happened here. And then Daniel Webster said, miracles do not cluster, what has happened once in 6,000 years may not happen again. Hold on to the Constitution, for if the American Constitution should fail, there will be anarchy throughout the world. Why would there be anarchy throughout the world? Because for 6,000 years, people have been suffering under the thumbs of Pharaoh, Caesars, and Kaisers, and they thought, gee, if only we could rule ourselves without a king, wouldn't that be wonderful? And in America, we did it, and if we blow it, there's nothing left for humanity to look forward to this side of heaven than what? Chinese dictators, uh, Russian dictators, Iranian Ayatollah dictators, North Korean dictators. It's going to be a gang war on a global scale, right? America has been holding back this, <laughs> this antichrist spirit, right? Because we've been the people, be, but once, once America's down, forget it. It's going to be back to this gang war, and then you got the... You know, the kings are going to give their power to the one, you know, the Antichrist. And, for the, and, and there's, it's going to be a reconcentration of power globally, and it's going to happen super fast. Anyway, now, how did America come, up, come about? Um, you have Romans, three centuries, persecute Christians, and Constantine stops the persecution. Next big one is Attila the Hun scourging, and then he stopped. The next big one of attack is Islam. And they conquer uh, all of what used to be Christian. And so the Muslims conquered Jerusalem, which had been a Byzantine Christian city since Constantine. Uh, St. Helena, his mom, built all these cathedrals there. Uh, Syria was conquered by Caliph Umar. Syria was the first country that was completely Christian, evangelized by the Apostle Paul. And then the Muslims conquered into Armenia, which was completely Christian. And then the Muslims conquered into Egypt. People forget Egypt was Christian for six centuries. Evangelized by Mark that wrote the gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, until Amir ibn Alas conquers it. And then there used to be 250 Catholic dioceses along North Africa. Right? St. Augustine of Hippo was from Carthage. Today that's Tunisia. The Christians had, had a movement sweep through called pietism that says if you're really Christian, you'll give away all your money and live in a cave as a hermit the rest of your life. <laughs> or join a monastery. It was like, withdraw from society and just enjoy your own personal relationship with God. And the Christians, it was their version of separation of church and state. Right? We're not going to be involved. We're not going to be involved. So Islam just, boom, 10 years just swept through all of North Africa, and then they conquered into Spain. And um, the Spaniards were still fighting on foot with heavy metal swords. Muslims were on Arabian horses with stirrups. In 10 years, they conquered all of Spain. 
And um, then the Muslims invaded Rome in 846 AD, 11,000 Muslim pirates, and they sacked the Basilica of St. Peter's, and they trashed the bones of St. Peter and St. Paul. It was after that that Pope Leo decided to build the 39-foot wall around the Vatican. And, uh, and then the Turks convert to Islam, and they conquer into what is today Turkey. All seven churches mentioned in the book of Revelation were wiped out by the Muslim Turks. And, uh, and then the, the Greeks beg the West for help. The West send help. It's called the Crusades. When they fail, they end. The Muslims conquer Constantinople in 1453. Constantinople was the biggest city in Europe. And it was Christian. And it was where the East and West met. And um, people forget a couple centuries before, you had Marco Polo go from Venice to Constantinople all the way over to China. Marco, remember the kids play the game, Marco Polo. And so when the Muslims conquered Central Asia and then sacked Constantinople, it cut off the land routes. And that's when Columbus set sail looking for a sea route. Columbus thought he made it to India, so he names the people he meets the Indians. Think of it, we never would have called Native Americans Indians had it not been for Islamic Jihad. Right? Why did Columbus call them Indians? Because he thought he was an Indian. Why was he trying to get to India in 1492? Because in 1453, the Muslims conquered Constantinople, cutting off the land routes to India. So, gee, we probably wouldn't have even had a state called Indiana <laughs> had it not been for Islamic Jihad, cutting off the land routes to India and China. Anyway, so the uh, Muslim Sultan, Suleiman the Magnificent, uh, is controlling the uh, Ottoman Empire, and they enslave an estimated one to two million Europeans. There were whole Catholic orders in Europe called the Trinitarians that would ra ransom back your friend. And then they enslaved an estimated 180 million Africans. And then you had the King of Spain trying to stop the Muslims. And um, so these are the two most powerful kings on the planet, the King of Spain and the Muslim Sultan, Suleiman the Magnificent. And in the middle of all this, the Reformation starts, Martin Luther. And then he has to have a trial before the king of Spain. So that's Charles V. He's 25 years old, and he calls it an argument among monks. You got one monk here, and you got a bunch of monks there. And um, he uh, let, takes um, Martin Luther out from under his protection. So Martin Luther's swept away, hidden in a castle, translates the Bible into German. Meanwhile, the Muslims are still conquering. And uh, Martin Luther says the fight against the Turks must begin with repentance. We must reform our lives or we shall fight in vain our sins. If we're in God's wrath, so he justly gives us into the hands of the devil and the Turk. So the king of Spain has two problems, a double dilemma, the Protestant Reformation on the inside of Europe and the Muslim invasion on the outside of, the, of Europe. And um, he tries to stop both for decades, tries to stop the Protestants, tries to stop the Islam, and can't. And so he finally decides to do a deal with the Protestants. It's called the Peace of Augsburg of 1555. And... Uh, you know how to say 1555 in German? Eintausend fünfhundert fünfundfünfzig. I took German in college. I thought it was anyway. So in this piece of Augsburg in 1555 is a little Latin phrase called "Cuius uh, regio ius religio," which means "Whose is the reign? His is the religion." So this allowed every king to decide what's going to be believed in his kingdom. This is the first treaty ever to recognize Protestants. And so um, they work together. Sometimes God lets the heat get on so that we have to work together. <laughs> and um, so in Europe, it was what the king believed the kingdom had to believe. And if you didn't believe the way your particular king did, you were persecuted, you fled. And so you had northern Germany and Sweden were Lutheran, Switzerland Calvinist, Scotland Presbyterian, Holland Dutch Reformed. Greece was Greek Orthodox, Spain, Portugal, France, etc., Catholic. Russians invited the Mennonites over, and so they were, uh, lived in a land between the Ottoman Turks and Russia, and, and then the England had Anglicans. And so Europe went from all being Catholic to thrown suddenly into this mass migration of people shifting from one country to another for conscience sake. And so it was one Christian denomination per country. If you didn't believe the way your king did, you were persecuted. So let's look at England. There was a king named Henry VIII. He was married to the daughter of the king of Spain. And after 18 years, she does not have a son. So he decides to divorce her. Uh, the pope won't recognize the divorce because she is, after all, the daughter of the most powerful guy in the world. 
And so the Pope says no. And Henry says, you know what? I'm just going to make myself my own Pope. Right? And then he marries Catherine uh, Anne Boleyn. And so here you have the King of England is the head of the Anglican Church, followed by the Archbishop of Canterbury and York and the bishops and deaneries and vicars and curates. And, and it's this hierarchical system. He goes on to have six wives. Their fates were divorced, beheaded, died, divorced, beheaded, survived. Henry VIII was not a nice guy to be married to. And um, his advisors came to him and said, King, if you're serious about breaking from Rome, you need to stop using the Latin Bible. Get yourself an English Bible. The German princes have Martin Luther's German Bible. That helped them to break away from Rome. You need an English Bible. He says, fine, get me one. Well, it just so happens a few years earlier, he had William Tyndall burnt at the stake for translating the Bible into English. William Tyndall's last words were, Lord, open the king of England's eyes. And now he wants an English Bible. So they take Tyndall's work, polish it up. They call it the Great Bible. And Henry orders a copy of it put in every church in England. This is the first time the common people in England can read the Bible in their own English language. And the king dusts his hands and says, that's it, we broke him from Rome, got our English Bible, but something unexpected happened. People began to read it. And began to compare what's in the Bible to this king divorcing and beheading his wives. And so a group starts that wants to purify the Church of England, and they're nicknamed the Puritans. And then the, the king doesn't think he needs purifying, he persecutes them. And there's another group that said it's beyond hope of purifying, we're going to separate ourselves, and they're called separatists or pilgrims. So we go from the most common form of government in world history is kings that keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, and then we got this Reformation, and the king of Spain goes ahead and lets the Protestants believe what they want. So you got different kings in different kingdoms. We got England. The king says, okay, you got to believe what I tell you to believe, but now you got these, these pilgrims and these separatists. And, um, and in the middle of all this, um, when the separatists split away, they begin to look on how to have a government without a king. And so we're building up to America. And um, so a couple of instances. Uh, in 1571, uh, you have the, the Spain stops the Muslims on the Mediterranean with the Battle of Lepanto, biggest batter, battle ever on the Mediterranean. But rather than following up the victory with freeing the Mediterranean from the Muslim Turks, Spain decides to send its military to crush the Reformation in Holland and in England. So in 1752, Spain sends the Iron Duke of Alba to commit the Spanish fury in Antwerp, Holland, and kills tens of thousands of Protestants. Just leaves their bodies in the streets. And then the King of Spain sends his armada to stop the Reformation in England. And then in France, 15% of France is Protestant. And the queen, Catherine de' Medici, uh, the husband dies. She's ruling France through the young son. Uh, she decides to marry her daughter to uh, the number one Protestant leader, Henry of Navarre. And it's a big wedding in Paris. A couple days after the wedding, she has him pull the chains across the streets so the carriages can't go out of town. And she sends her soldiers house to house, and they kill 30,000 Protestant leaders called the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre, and they throw their bodies in the Seine River. And you have some uh, question as to what do we do with Romans 13? Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established, the authorities that exist have been established by God. You got, okay, we submit to the king, but what if the king is literally out to kill you <laughs> and kill your wife and kill your children? You're just supposed to say, okay, here they are. And so in the French-speaking area of Switzerland, you have a guy named John Calvin. And he begins to write things like, when kings disobey God, they automatically abdicate their worldly power. He says, he who does not make his reign subservient to divine glory acts not the part of a king but of a robber. We are subject to the men who rule over us, but subject only in the Lord. If they command anything against him, let us not pay the least regard to it. What's he talking about? Well, the Bible says children obey your parents. But what if there's a parent that tells his kid to sell themselves into prostitution and kill the neighbor? Is the kid supposed to obey? 
No, the kid obeys the parent as long as the parent's telling them to do something that lines up with God's word. You obey the king, the government, as long as the government lines up with God's word. And if the government is pushing an agenda that doesn't line up with God's word, you don't obey. And, and so these Calvinist Puritans begin to develop this form of government where the people could rule themselves. And they got their ideas from the Bible, but what part of the Bible? That first 400 years out of Egypt before King Saul. It's called the Hebrew Republic. And these Puritan scholars are called Christian Hebraists. And so suddenly you realize that when you study these 6,000 years of world history, kings, 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 bigger, 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 something stands out. It's ancient Israel. Around 1400 BC, they come out of Egypt. And for 400 years, no king. Everyone's equal before the law. And the law specifically said there's no respect of persons in judgment. So everybody's taught the law, and everybody obeys the law because they're personally accountable to God. I mean, it's a system that worked for 400 years. And so these Calvinist Puritans looked to the Bible as their authority, but they looked to the pre-King Saul period of the Bible. right? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1 Samuel. But... The people go to Samuel the prophet. They say, ah, this self-government system's not working. We want to be like the other countries. We want a king. Samuel anoints King Saul, and for the rest of Israel's history, they have a king. God still works his plan of redemption, but the people no longer rule themselves. And so King Saul is the divider between America and England. England, the kings look to the Bible for their authority, but they look to this anointed king, divine right of kings. I'm the chosen lieutenant in between God and these public, right? They look to the King Saul and on period. The colonial founders of America look to the pre-King Saul period. Millions of people, we rule ourselves because we're all taught the law and we all are accountable to God. So the king of England's attitude was, yes, you can read the Bible in your own language, but no, you still can't believe whatever you want. You gotta believe what I tell you to believe. And because uh, I'm the king. So you do not make up prayers because you couldn't make up a prayer that's wrong. So the government wrote all the prayers down, put them in a book. It's called the Book of Common Prayer. You feel in the mood to pray, you just open it to the right page and read the prayer. And if you're caught with a group making up your own prayers, the FBI will bust in, handcuff you, drag you to a hearing room. And uh, had stars on the ceiling, called, it was called the Star Chamber, sort of like a January 6th hearing room, you know. And. Um, <laughs> And they would twist your arm and brand you on the face as a heretic and, and make you confess to something you didn't do. And then they would throw you in a cell where they'd let you rot for days and weeks and months and years. Could you imagine the government doing something like that? And, um, and then they passed the Five Mile Act. If you're caught preaching within five miles of a town without getting approval of the government, they're going to arrest you and drag you to that star chamber. And then they had the Conventicle Act, came from the word covenant, where two or three are gathered in my name, I'm in the midst, and the king didn't like you having small groups and because uh, you could be planning an insurrection. So they later changed the name of it to the Riot Act, and the police would bust into your little Bible study, put all a piece of paper, and read the Riot Act, which says everyone must immediately disperse or we're going to drag you to that star chamber and lock you away in a jail cell until you'll die. If somebody that was caught during this was John Bunyan. And he spent 12 years in jail. And that's when he wrote Pilgrim's Progress. So the king was banning these small group meetings. He even banned coffee houses. <laughs> right? So coffee came from Ethiopia, the one African country to stay Christian. And the Muslims called the Christians in Ethiopia coffers, which means infidel. And so the, since the bean came from there, they called it the coffer bean or the infidel bean. And, um, and then the Muslims are invading into Europe, and they're bringing their bags. Of, uh, and after the Battle of um, uh, Vienna, they uh, are lose, and they leave their tents with their beans, and, and uh, they weren't sure if they should drink it. So they took a cup of it to Pope Clement, and he tasted it, said, this is too good to leave for the Muslims. Let's baptize it. And then coffee spread across Europe. <laughs> so have you had your cup of infidel today? <laughs> but it's okay to drink. Pope Clement said so. And um, so they had 3,000 coffee houses in England. People would gather together and talk bad about the king. And so he shut those down. And, um, not, and so we have um, uh, these different denominations starting. Uh, the Baptists were a congregational church that started at this time. And one of the Baptist founders, John Merton, was put in prison. 
They don't feed you in prison, and they obviously don't give you anything to write with. And so some f uh, friends sneak him a bottle of milk, but instead of a cork, had a wad of paper. And when the guard wasn't around, he unfolded the paper, took a splinter, dipped it in the milk, wrote out his pamphlets. Milk dries, it's clear, folds it up, puts it in the empty bottle. Friend takes it home, unfolds it, and holds it above a candle. And the heat of the candle turned the milk brown, and they could see what he wrote, types at the pamphlets and print them. So the early Baptist called the milk of the word, because <laughs> he wrote it in milk. And then one of the things he said is, no man ought to be persecuted for his religion. Another thing, the practices of Christ and his disciples teaches no such thing as compelling men by persecution and affliction to obey the gospel. Anyway, so you, you have more, but I, um, uh, William Penn spent eight months in the Tower of London. He said, force makes hypocrites, tis persuasion only that makes converts. And so that's when you have the um, pilgrims fleeing from England, going to the Netherlands, and then fleeing the Netherlands. They were going to go to Jamestown, get blown off course, land in Massachusetts. And that's when they, um, they were, the captain says, it's too dangerous to try to sail, and so get off the boat. And they say, who's going to be in charge? And um, they don't know, and so they decide, because uh, they don't have a king-appointed person in their group. So they decide to give themselves the authority to start a government, and it's called the Mayflower Compact. And uh, it says, we, in the presence of God, covenant, or, covenant ourselves to, together into a civil body politic. So you have a church group covenanting itself into a civil body politic. You have a church group forming itself into a political group. Now, why did they do that? To enact just and equal laws that shall be thought most meet or necessary unto which we promise all due submission. Simple, revolutionary. It was a polarity change in the flow of power on planet Earth. Instead of top-down, ruled by kings, it's bottom-up, ruled by we. In the womb of this Mayflower is conceived the child of self-government. Right? It's the difference between a dead pyramid, kings who rule through fear, and a living tree, bottom up, where every root and every tiny capillary root sucks in nutrients to keep it alive. And so they got their idea for this from their pastor, John Robinson, and uh, that painting hangs in the U.S. Capitol Rotunda. And so the, um, the pastors, it wasn't the hierarchical model where the king's in charge and through, he rules through all these bishops. It's a congregation model where the pastor's job is to get everybody to have their own relationship with God the Father through Jesus Christ that died on the cross for their sins, and then coach them to become mature Christians, read the Bible, pray, and then get them to plug into the body and do something. Nursery, children's nurse, junior high, because anything that's alive takes in and gives out. Any muscle to grow has to be exercised. That's why I hated the COVID response so much. Right? We all sort of felt something was wrong with that. Why? Because it said, look, change your church government back to this hierarchical model. You can hear a great sermon, but what are you going to do? Witness to your pillow? <laughs> right? Ministry takes place where you hear something and then you put yourself in a position of giving out, right? Loving and helping people and counseling and giving out the, you know, benevolence or whatever it is. So the pilgrims called it a covenant form of government. You get rights and blessings from God. You voluntarily share them with your neighbor because you're doing it as unto God. And um, John Winthrop, one of the founders, said, this love among Christians is a real thing, not imaginary. We are a company professing ourselves fellow members of Christ. We ought to account ourselves knit together by this bond of love. We must make one another's condition our own. Rejoice together, mourn together, labor and suffer together. We shall find the God of Israel is among us. So we're taking this Israel model 400 years before King Saul, and we're making it the American model. That we're, it's not socialism where the government takes away your stuff and redistributes it to supporters. No, it's you get stuff from God and you voluntarily share it with your neighbor because you're doing it as unto God. And the king didn't like that. He liked the hierarchical model, and so he persecutes them. And then you have a great Puritan migration, and uh, 20,000 Puritans flood in to America. And you have pastors and churches founding cities. A pastor, John Lothrop, and his church founded Barnstable, Massachusetts. A pastor, Roger Williams, and his church founded Providence, Rhode Island. A pastor, John Wheelwright, and his church founded Exeter, New Hampshire. A pastor, Thomas Hooker, and his church founded Hartford, Connecticut. This is unique on the planet. At a time when you have Russian czars, Chinese emperors, Indian maharajas, Muslim sultans, you have pastors and their churches founding cities. And so let's look at Thomas Hooker. He and his church found Hartford, Connecticut. After they get there, the church members come to him and say, Pastor, can you do a sermon on how we're supposed to set up our government? He gives a sermon in 1638 titled, The Foundation of Authority is Laid in the Free Consent of the People. This is reflected in our de declaration, government from the consent of the governed. And this is different from Europe because the kings of Europe could care less about your consent. And um, anyway, uh, 
Calvin Coolidge Thomas Hooker of Connecticut, as early as 1638, said in a sermon before the general court, the foundation of authority is laid in the free consent of the people. And so his sermon's written down. It's called The Fundamental Orders of Connecticut, and it's used as the Constitution for Connecticut from 1639 up until 1818. They're using the pastor's sermon. And that's why Connecticut's called the Constitution State. Here's a plaque in England, Thomas Hooker, founder of the state of Connecticut, father of American democracy. Another plaque, Thomas Hooker, Puritan clergyman, reputed father of American democracy. Statue of Thomas Hooker holding a Bible on the Capitol grounds in Hartford, the base leading his people through the wilderness. He found that Hartford on the site he preached the sermon, which inspired the fundamental orders. It was the first written constitution that created a government. Another plaque, here minister Thomas Hooker, peerless leader in New England thought and life in both church and state. Another plaque, Thomas Hooker, preacher, statesman, who based all civil authority on the free consent of the people. Another plaque, uh, here preached his Thomas Hooker, his famous sermon, the foundation of authority is laid in the free consent of the people. And then representatives adopted his sermon as the fundamental orders. What do they say? The people can join ourselves to be as one public state or commonwealth. Who are the people? It's the church members. You have the church members forming themselves into a public state, right? A church group forming itself into a political group. Now, why did they do that? To preserve the liberty and purity of the gospel of our Lord Jesus. And so another plaque, lots of plaques. This one says, Thomas Hooker's congregation established the form of government upon which the present Constitution of the United States is modeled. Our government was started as a church plant. America was started as a church plant. And so in New England, instead of separation of church and state, it was the pastors and their churches that created the state. How could you say, pastor, don't preach on politics, when it's his sermon that's their constitution? How could you say church members don't get involved in politics when all there was in Hartford was the church members? There were like no non-church members to be lazy. The word politics comes from the Greek word polis, which means city. Indianapolis, right? Politics is simply the business of the city, and all there was in the city of Hartford was the church. And so they had one building. It was called the Meeting House. That's where the pastor would teach the Bible, and that's where they would gather together and do their city business. The word synagogue means meeting house. That's where the rabbis would teach the Bible, and that's where they would get together and do their city business. Why build a separate building just to talk about a different topic? And so when the Revolutionary War starts, the British send over a military governor, Thomas Gage, and he outlaws meeting houses. He says, democracy is too prevalent in America. We don't need you meeting and deciding stuff, yet just obey government mandates. If the government mandates it, you just blindly obey whatever they tell you. Calvin Coolidge says, The principles which went into the Declaration of Independence are found in the sermons of the early colonial clergy. In order they might have freedom to express these thoughts and opportunities to put them into action, whole congregations with their pastors migrated to the colonies. So I read through every charter of every colony. Every colony was started by a different Christian denomination. Virginia was Anglican. Massachusetts was Puritan. Connecticut and New Hampshire were congregational. Rhode Island was Baptist. Uh, New York was originally New Netherlands, and it was Dutch Reformed. And uh, New, New Sweden turned into New Jersey and Delaware, and they were Swedish Lutheran. And then Maryland was founded by Catholics, and the Carolinas were founded by the Anglicans, and South Carolina split away, plain Protestant, Georgia Protestant, Pennsylvania Quaker. And they didn't get along. And they'd tar and feather each other. But then they had to work together against the King of England, very similar to the way the King of Spain had to work together with these Protestants to fight the Islamic invasion into Europe. And um, is this interesting? Yeah. And um, now, uh, I, I, I usually look up and see a clock, but I see an exit sign. So, um, <laughs> so, so, so I got how many more minutes? Oh, I thought I was going to get a 10-minute warning. Um, anyway, uh, so, um, so let's look at ancient Israel. And uh, the, um, what? So they looked to ancient Israel. Ancient Israel was the first place where everyone was equal because there was no king, no royal family. So Israel was the beginning of the concept of equality. They had tolerance. They were worshiping the one true God. They never felt compelled to force anybody to worship the one true God. Uh, ancient Israel was the first nation with private land ownership. You see, wherever there's a king, you never really own the land. 
It's always conditional of you staying on the nice side of the king. When the children of Israel entered the promised land, every family was given property. You own property, you can accumulate stuff. The Bible called that being blessed. You can give away some of your stuff. The Bible called that charity. Uh, ancient Israel, everyone was taught the law, including children. And then everybody helped enforce the law so they didn't have police. They didn't have a standing army because every man was in the militia armed with a sword upon their thigh and ready at a moment's notice to defend their family. Israel had no prisons like Joseph was in prison in Egypt. In Israel, when there was a crime, you got the elders, you had the trial out the city gates, and then a city of refuge, bureaucracy, free welfare system. In Egypt, you need food. The government will give you food, but it's in exchange for your cattle and land. In Israel, when you harvested your field, you left the gleanings for the poor people. This way, the poor were taken care of in a decentralized manner. And then Israel got to choose their own leaders. Moses spake unto the children of Israel, How can I myself alone bear your burden, take you wise men and understanding, and known among your tribes, and I'll make them rulers over you? And so anyone can be raised up into leadership. Here's Gideon, here's Deborah, a woman, becomes a national leader, not because she's related to royalty. She just knows the law, she's honest, the reputation spreads. And so, um, so ancient Israel was the first nation that could read. And um, what would motivate you to follow the law? So all governments on this, one side you got total government with these kings. They keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger. The opposite is no government, which would be anarchy. But for there to be order with no government, the people need to have virtue. And um, I liken it to downloading a behavioral app on your iPhone. All right? So the Levites were like the computer geeks that help you to get this app to tell you how to act. But the big question is, why would you follow it? What would motivate you to follow an internal moral? Israel had the key ingredient. There's a God who's watching everyone. He wants you to be fair. And he's going to hold you accountable in the future. You're about to steal. Nobody's around. Then you think, God's watching me. He wants me to be fair. He's going to hold me accountable. Maybe I should hesitate stealing. Create something in your head called the conscience. If everybody in the country believes this, you can maintain complete order with no police. Now, God knew that you would sin. And so once a year, they had the Day of Atonement. And everyone's sins in the country were forgiven. And they started the new year off with a clean slate. And obviously, that is foreshadowing Jesus. And so uh, I want to skip past this. We go through world history. The most common form of government's kings. America's founders flipped it, made the people the king. And, um, but I, I want to end with this one thought. And this is the, uh, the idea is we're the bride of Christ. And every romance novel builds up to a decision-making moment, a forsaking of all others and choosing the one. And it's almost like God is letting there be crises intentionally to push us to the place of making a decision. And some people are going to choose the all others. They're going to want to be liked and friended and followed. And others are going to say, I don't care about all, all others. All I care about is Jesus. You know, you think of it. Let's look at the big, big, big picture in my closing here. So in 2003, they focused the Hubble telescope on a spot in the sky where there was nothing. Size of a grain of sand, held between your fingers at arm's length against the night sky. Tiny spot, nothing there. After 11 days, they developed the images. And in that spot, um, they saw... 10,000 galaxies with hundreds of billions of stars in each galaxy. It's called the Hubble Ultra Deep Space Field. This is the picture. This is not an artist's rendition. This is the furthest picture ever taken away from planet Earth. And every dot you see is a galaxy with hundreds of billions of stars. And um, light travels in waves. Now they got the James Webb Telescope looked at the same spot. And they saw light travels in waves, with blue being the shortest, fastest, red being the slowest, longest. They saw the red shift, which means these galaxies are moving away from us. They now estimate the observable universe is 93 billion light years across and still expanding at the speed of light. And the largest star they found is Stevenson 2-18, a super gas giant. So large, if you were to place it in our solar system, it would engulf the orbit of Saturn, the sixth planet from the sun. We're the third planet. Could you imagine one single star that enormous? That God made all of it, and he made you. Why would he make you? What could you offer a being that is that powerful? When you think of it, what, what's a galaxy anyway? It's a bunch of rocks, hot rocks, cold rocks, vaporized rocks, enormous rocks. A rock cannot love you. It's almost like at some time in eternity past, God said, been there, done that. I would really like someone in my image that could love me. Now it gets interesting because love by definition must be voluntary. The moment it's forced, it evaporates. So in this context of everything God controls, time, matter, space, energy, he created one little thing. He doesn't control your will. He could control it if he wanted to, but that would defeat the very reason he made you different than everything else. He doesn't need your love. He's not incomplete in some way, and your love somehow completes him. He didn't, doesn't need your love, but he wants it. Parents don't need the love of their children, but they want it. 
what's the most important thing in your life? Well, somewhere at the top of the list is loving and being loved. And if you're made in God's image, could it be that loving and being loved is important to him? And he loves everything he made, but could he be loved back? You know, I looked at the word angel in the King James Bible. It appears 289 times. Never once does it say the angels love God. They worship him, they glorify him, they praise him, they smite his enemies, they deliver his judgments, they deliver messages to Daniel and Mary. They are heavenly witnesses. They rejoice when a sinner converts, but the word love is not used in any verse in the Bible to describe an angel's relationship with God. They are, they are not made in God's image, and Jesus did not die on the cross for angels. They're mighty and powerful, and they're brilliant and intelligent, right? But they were made for a purpose. What purpose were you made for? We're not very smart and we're not very intelligent. <laughs> Why would God make us? Well, guess what? The word love is used all throughout the Bible when it comes to men and women. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. Right? Jesus rises from the dead and says, Peter, do you love me? We are beings created with the ability to love God, but love by definition must be voluntary. The moment it's forced, it evaporates. The moment God would force you in any way to love him, he himself would know he's forcing you to love him, and he would know your response is not a love response. So he'll never force you. But the second thing is he has to hide himself behind his creation. Because if he ever reveals himself to you in all of his universe, creating omnipotent power, brighter than a trillion, trillion suns, your response, if you didn't melt, would be like the Apostle John, the book of Revelation, I fell at his feet, is dead. It would be an involuntary response. In the presence of all power? And God's like, I can do involuntary all, all eternity long. I'm interested in this voluntary thing. So he hides himself behind his creation. People say, if God's real, why doesn't he show himself? Because the moment he shows himself, your free will's gone. In the presence of such power? It's like a billionaire has a son who goes to college, flies in on his private jet, drives up in his Lamborghini, gold rings, Rolex watch, He's going to have every girl on campus wanting to meet him. But if he lays that aside, drives up in an old clunker, got holes in his jeans, the uppity girls are going to ignore him. But then there's a girl that likes to study with him in the library, and they eat together in the cafeteria, and they become friends. And she takes heat from the clique for hanging around this nobody guy. But she believes in him. They fall in love. They get engaged. And then he says, hey, I want to take you back to meet my dad. And they're like driving up to this castle mansion, and the girl's like, whoa, you didn't tell me about all this. He knows that she loves him for him, not because of all of his stuff. Jesus laid aside his glory and was born humbly in a major. He only wants those that love him for him. But there's a third thing, and it's the last thing. God is just, and he cannot help it, right? Which means he has to judge every sin. And so if he makes free will beings, hides himself so we have free will, but if we step out of line one time, he has to judge us. Because if he doesn't judge our sin, by default, he's giving consent to the sin. It's called the rule of tacit admission. And we see it in wedding ceremonies. The pastor says, if you're silent, you're giving consent to the wedding. Speak now or forever, hold your peace. If there are sins going on and God is silent and not judging the sin, by default, he'd be giving consent to the sin. And if God gives consent to one sin, one time, he denies himself. He denies his just nature. He ungods himself. He's kicked out of heaven. And he is not going to get kicked out of heaven, and he is not going to deny himself, and he is going to judge every sin. So he could never be loved back, because if something steps out of line, he's got to judge it. So he came up with a plan, and the plan is his own son would become the lamb and take the judgment that we all deserve upon himself. So God is just and that he judges every sin. He's love and that he provided the lamb to take the judgment. So Abraham and Isaac are going to the top of Mount Moriah, and Isaac says, Father, we have the wood for the sacrifice. We have the coals for the sacrifice. But where's the sacrifice? And Abraham says, Son, God will provide himself a sacrifice. And it has a double meaning. Trust in God will have a ram up in the bush, but the other is God will provide himself. And that's what happened. Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, the only begotten Son of God, in the plan of redemption that was hidden from ages. It was a hidden plan. It says if the princes of this world had known, they never would have crucified the Lord of glory. The Apostle Paul calls it the mystery of the gospel. It was a hidden plan. Jesus came to earth, became a man, and only as a man could God hang on a cross and die for our sins. It says in Isaiah 53, it pleased the Lord to crush him. Charles Wesley wrote, Amazing love, how could it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me? And you think, okay, God is just, and there's billions of us, and one of him, and we all 
have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We all deserve eternal damnation. If God is just, how, how, does, how can one person pay for all of our sins? Jesus is divine, and he experienced that judgment from a, dim a dimension we'll never understand. It says a day with the Lord is as a thousand years and a thousand years as a day. He experienced that day on the cross as if it was a thousand years. You know, we read the book of Revelation, and I'm still trying to figure it out. That's why I love hearing all Tommy Ice and, the, and Don Perkins and the others. But one thing seems really clear in the book of Revelation. It's God that is pouring out the judgment. Right? The lamb breaks the seal. The angel throws the censer. The angel blows the trumpet. It's God. Why is that? Well, this is the final judgment. God's a just God. He has to judge every sin. Because if he doesn't judge, he's giving consent. And if he gives consent to sin, he denies himself. So he has to judge every sin. But this is the final judgment, right? So there'll never have to be any more judging for the rest of eternity. But in that sense, Jesus had the book of Revelation judgment poured out on his head. He took the judgment for every sin that everybody would ever do upon himself on the cross. That's why he was sweating drops of blood. Experienced it as if it was a thousand years. And then when we're in Christ, that means that we're not going to go through the final judgment, because it would be judging the same sin twice. And God's a just God, and he's not going to judge the same sin twice. So he judged all of our sin in Christ, and we are in Christ. Does that make sense? And so you think, well, how can one person, and he, so Jesus is divine, and I got a degree in accounting, so I like things that balance. You take an eternal being, Jesus, who's innocent, suffering for a finite, limited period of time. It's equal to all of us finite, limited beings, who are guilty, suffering for an eternal period of time. Let me say that again. An eternal being who's innocent, suffering for a finite period of time, is equal to all of us finite beings who are guilty, suffering for an eternal period of time. Infinity times finite equals finite times infinity. An unlimited being, suffering for a limited period of time, is equal to all of us limited beings, suffering for an unlimited period of time. Jesus literally suffered the equivalent of eternal damnation in all of our places, and he is the only one who could have done it. And out of love for the Father and out of love for you and me, he became the Lamb. This way, you and I can approach this universe-creating, omnipotent, all-just God and not have to worry about being judged. The Lamb is his plan to love you without having to judge you. It's his plan. And then he fills us with the Holy Spirit. So instead of you doing good works, hoping to earn brownie points with God, you're already accepted by God, and it's the Holy Spirit doing the good works through you. Love the unlovable, rescue those unjustly sentenced to death, defend the defenses, feed the hungry, clothe the naked, right? And we get to be a part of his plan and spend the rest of eternity with God. Thank you so much.